Let us worship the Lord together. I invite you, if you're able, to stand as we all stand in our hearts and reverence the Lord this morning as we hear his call, his invitation to come into his presence and worship him. So we read in Isaiah chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples, proclaim that His name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let us pray and ask the Lord to help us as we answer His call. Lord, our glorious and great triune God, we thank you for this invitation to ascend the mountain, come into your presence. We thank you that that you've given us your covenant promises that you will come and dwell with us that the means of grace will be flowing. And Lord, as we come, as we answer, we do come with hearts overflowing with joy and thanksgiving in all before you. Lord, we ask that you would cause all of our worship this morning and this evening to be a sweet aroma before you, that your name would be lifted up and that the Spirit would be at work amongst us. Oh, Lord, do all this for your glory and our benefit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let us put our voices together in praise as we sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. You'll find on page 7 in your order of service. thankful uh, that our great God uh, is the one who can forgive. We can trust that as we come to him by faith and confess our sins 
that he will forgive them. So let's do that now. Let's pray aloud together uh, our confession of sin, and then we'll take a few moments that we might all be able to pray and confess silently. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the devices and desires of our hearts, leaving undone those things which we ought to have done in doing those things which we ought not to have done. Father, have mercy upon us. Forgive us who confess our sins and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant by the power of the Spirit that we may hereafter live godly, righteous, and faithful lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And as we confess by sin here now, by faith, the Lord's assurance of pardon from His Word. As we read in Psalm 33, beginning in verse 13, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where He sits enthroned, He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. As we turn our attention from our confession of sin and, and hearing the assurance of the Lord's uh, pardon and forgiveness from his word, we, we turn our attention now to a confession of faith. We're going to be using a portion of the Athanasian Creed, a uh, creed from the 4th century that uh, specifically uh, was written by the church to refute heresies involving uh, the deity and uh, the humanity of Jesus Christ. So this morning we're going to be joining our uh, confession uh, with the confession of the church militant and triumphant. So what is it that you believe? It is necessary to everlasting salvation that one believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who although he is God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by assumption of the manhood into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Amen. Well, as you remain seated, we'll respond to this truth we've confessed as we sing the doxology to the Lord. You'll find it.
continue to worship the Lord, let's pray as we prepare to give. Oh Lord, as we come now to the time in our worship service, we have the opportunity to, to give to you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to come with hearts that overflow with thanksgiving, that rejoice in generosity, that we might give just a little of the much that you've given to us, even as we are reminded of all that you've given to us that we have in Christ. Lord, we pray for the offering. We pray for uh, our gifts to you throughout the week and in this morning, our, the gifts of our time and treasure and talents, that, Lord, as they come to you, you might take them and multiply them beyond our imagination. Lord, we ask that you would give wisdom in the oversight of these funds, that we might meet the needs uh, that need to be met, that we would use them for the furtherance of the kingdom as we seek to proclaim the gospel throughout Northwest Knox. And Lord, we ask for a great harvest in this, that your name might be glorified. Disciples of Jesus would be made. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is none like you. There is none holy, just, sovereign, gracious, merciful, and almighty as you are. And Father, you, you are fully aware and you know that, that we are weak and we easily go astray like wandering sheep. And so we ask that in your mercy you would strengthen us in Christ, our Savior. We ask that the Holy Spirit would, would work in us and, and cause us to grow, that he might strengthen our faith. We pray, Lord, for your work amongst us, not only for our spiritual care and nourishment, but also for our physical needs. We pray for the healing of those who are sick. We ask, Lord, that you might protect us from the sicknesses, the, the viruses, the different bugs that are floating around our community. We pray for our friends who are recovering from different injuries and surgeries. Lord, we pray for those amongst us who have uh, various afflictions that they, in your good providence, uh, have in their life. Lord, we ask that you would help all of us to labor in the various callings that you've given to us, wherever those may be and, and what they may entail. And that as we do that, we would labor cheerfully and with, with good attitudes, and that we might witness Christ in all that we do, even in the mundane things of life, that we would be reminded, uh, Lord, that you give to us callings, and that in those labors we are able to glorify you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be quick to carry each other's burdens, that, uh, Lord, we would look for opportunities that we might love one another, to come alongside each other. Lord, you have told us in your word that you give to your people, each of us, the, the different members of the body of Christ. You give us different gifts, and so we ask that you would, would help us to use those gifts and to receive the gifts from others, that we might care in the love of Christ for one another. And that even in that love that we would benefit from, that, that our neighbors would look upon us and see what a great difference. We're, we are truly disciples of Christ. If it is not normal for folks to love one another the way 
that we pray we would continue and grow in our love for each other. And might the Spirit even use such a thing to draw the lost to Christ. Lord, we ask that you'd grant us strong hearts and minds that grow in that love, love for you, that you would make us a people of integrity and character, that we would always have trustworthy speech, speech that glorifies you, that your truth would be our truth in all situations, that we would not look to the the flighty pseudo-truth of this world, that we would not accept the lie that everyone is able to create their own truth, but that instead we would embrace, learn about, rejoice in, and submit to your truth that you've revealed to us in your word. Lord, we ask you to grow us in Christ's likeness. You'd help us to be growing, faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And that you'd make us bold and courageous as we follow our King. Lord, let us not fear men and women. Let us not fear our neighbors. But instead, may we rightfully fear you, may we love you, and may we love our neighbors. And we ask that as we are bold and courageous for Jesus, that you would also help us to be humble and compassionate, that we be gentle, that we might have power under control, that we would be patient and long-suffering as you are. And in that patience and contentment and providence, Lord, that we, that we would benefit through your care. And we ask that you would use our sufferings and challenges to deepen our maturity, to deepen our trust and love for you. That as we go through this life and the providence that you've chosen, that we would see in the midst of all things that come our way that you are good and you can be trusted and we can be thankful for whatever comes our way. For we know that you are using it for your glory and the benefit of your church and the benefit of your people, our benefit. And Lord, we... We put before you your promise, what you say in your word. You have proclaimed that you will build your church, and we believe it. And so we ask that you would do that across your world. We ask that the church with the big C would grow in every corner and every far-flung tribe, tongue, and nation, and that you would be at work. And Lord, we pray for that here at Christ Church, that you would grow us and that we would not grow weary in our faithfulness to you and the calling that you've granted to us. And that you would give us, Lord, fruitfulness in the making of disciples, disciples that make disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would give us, give us hearts that overflow with compassion for the loss that are around us and a willingness to, to tell them the good news of the forgiveness that is found in Christ and, and that we might invite those around us to church and, and that we would look for ways that we might share the love of Christ and his gospel Grant us opportunities, Lord, and then give us, give us the boldness to step into them. Lord, we pray for our child protection class today, and as we pray for that, we pray for our children, our volunteers, we pray for our nursery, the different classes we have at midweek, for all the activities, Lord. Put a hedge of protection around all of us, particularly your lambs, but we pray that for all the sheep. Lord, protect Christ's church even as we pray that same protection for your church at large. Keep wolves from without, and Lord, remove wolves that might try to come from within. We ask that you would, would bless us with that loving, shepherding protection. Lord, we pray for VBS that's coming up. This will be our first one, so we ask that there would be great fruit, uh, that you would allow us to come and spend our time uh, serving and, and ministering to the children and the families that we get connected with. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would, would allow it to be not a time of, uh, of stress, but a time that would be filled with joy and rejoicing in Jesus and the gospel. Lord, we pray for your church at large. We pray for the country that you put us in, for America. We pray for our state of Tennessee and the city of Knoxville and the surrounding areas. Lord, we pray as you've told us to, to pray for our civil magistrate and for all those that you've placed into positions of civil authority. And Lord, as we pray these things, we pray that Christ would come quickly. 
And now we come putting our voices together and we pray aloud as, as Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we love the means of grace here at Christ Church. Those who are, who are newer with us, whether in person or online, one of the things that we enjoy is the historic practice and what we see in the scriptures of the continual, uh, not only uh, preaching and teaching through the scriptures, but the reading of the scriptures. And so we're going to uh, take advantage of that in our Old Testament, New Testament continuous reading now. Uh, we're almost to the end of Numbers in our Old Testament reading. We're in chapter 32. That's page 131 on your Pew Bible if you're using that. Um, Numbers 32, we're going to be reading verse 1 through 27, so not the entire chapter, but just a, a chunk of it. And we're reading of a, a controversy that, that uh, arises and surrounds the ter determination of the tribes of uh, Reuben and Gad as they seek to settle in Gilead. So let's read God's word. Numbers 32, starting in verse 1. Now the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had a very great number of livestock, and they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for livestock. So the people of Gad and the people of Reuben came and said to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the chiefs of the congregation, Ataroth, Dibon, Gazer, Nimrah, Hezbon, Elialal, Sebum, Nebo, and Baon, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants. Take us across the Jordan. But Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to the war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord has given them? Your fathers did this when I sent them from Kadesh, Baran, to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eskol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land that the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. None except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the, the Ken, Kenziite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And behold, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all this people. Then they came near to him and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones, but we will take up arms ready to go before the people of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones shall live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the people of Israel has gained his inheritance, for we will not inherit with, him, with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance has come to us on this side of the Jordan to the east. So Moses said to them, if you will do this, if you will take up arms to go before the Lord for the war, and every armed man of you will pass over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then after that you shall return and be free of obligation to the Lord and to Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and do what you have promised. And the people of Gad and the people of Reuben said to Moses, Your servants will do as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our livestock, and all our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will pass over every man who is armed for war before the Lord to battle as my Lord orders. We turn our attention to our new 
Testament continuous reading as we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Chapter 4, I know it says 3 in the bulletin, but just overlook that. Chapter 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 to 21. That's page 896, if you're using one of our pew Bibles, page 896. So 1 Corinthians, we're in, as I mentioned, uh, chapter 4, going to be beginning our reading in uh, verse 1, and we'll continue on. Uh, God is, uh, through the inspired writing here of uh, Paul to the church there in, in Corinth, is, is bringing a warning against unwarranted judging and in worldly pride amongst God's people. So this is God's word. Listen as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they should be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his condemnation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you? For I think that God has exhibited as apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Jesus Christ through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Well, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. Well, we've heard from God, and we have the opportunity now to sing His Word as we minister to one another and sing praises to Him. If you turn to page 9 here in your order of service, uh, you'll find Psalm 87 that we're going to sing together. So if you're able, I invite you to stand as we all sing.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us as we look forward to the reading and preaching of his word this morning. Our Father in heaven, we come and ask that you would bless us now as as your word is read and preached. We ask that the Holy Spirit would be working amongst us for all those who are here and all those who are listening that, that we might see a great harvest coming forward of those who have been appointed unto salvation and for the growth and and the equipping and the maturity of the saints that we might be growing as disciples of Christ, salt and light as we go out, witnesses of Jesus in every place. We pray that as your word is read and preached this morning, the Spirit would would be at work to magnify and lift up Christ before us. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 33 through 37. Uh, That's page 760 if you're using uh, the Pew Bible this morning. Uh, Perhaps you grabbed one on the way in, which you might be using there. Uh, We're looking uh, at the Sermon on the Mount, Christ's Sermon on the Mount. We're continuing our way through uh, in the series. I'll remind you what, uh, what Dr. Sinclair Ferguson tells us about uh, Christ's sermon. He says, it's not a sermon about an ideal life and an ideal world, but it's about kingdom life and a fallen world. And we see that again this morning as we work our way through focusing in upon Christ's teaching. This uh, sermon, once again, is shown to us to be just as applicable, uh, just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago when he was uh, preaching to his disciples and those uh, around him. So let's turn our attention now. We read just a few verses in the midst of this sermon. Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. As we look at verses 33 through 37. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Well, may the Lord take his, his word and plant these seeds of of truth in our hearts and minds and bring forth great fruit in the days and years ahead, his glory. I was recently talking to a a friend of mine who is a a professor at a school, and uh, this professor was talking about their frustration over, now this is what I'm about to tell, it's not necessarily a broad brush for all colleges all students, but just this particular professor's situation. And what the professor said is, I think at least half the papers I'm receiving in my class were completely written by AI. Like, like John, not, not just that, that students, as they're using other resources and they're doing research, that they're, that they're utilizing you know, AI to help in different ways, but literally, like, I am picking up, I think that they're just putting a prompt in and whatever spits out, they're literally turning in. But the problem is that I can't do anything about it. He said, all I can do is ask the students, is this your work? The finished product, is this your work? And I have to go with what they say, yes or no. He said, now I'm excited because I'm hearing about more artificial intelligence being created that's actually going to find out written sole artificial intelligence papers. So one day I'll be able to not have to worry about people being truthful. We said the problem is, is I really genuinely think by reading these papers and knowing these students that 
they didn't have anything to do with this. But all I can do is simply go by their yes or no. And whether they have the integrity to say, yes, this is the paper I wrote, or no, I basically got this paper from someone or something else. And it's very, uh, it's very interesting times that we're in, and they're probably just going to get even more interesting as far as technology goes, which is another reason why it's so important that we be people of integrity, that we have trustworthy speech in every area. I mean, sadly, you talk to folks and you get this feeling like, like there's almost uh, the zeitgeist of the moment or the, the overflowing of, of the culture is one that to, to be a man or a woman of your word is almost like quaint and cute and old-fashioned. It's not seen as something that's important anymore. I mean, there was a time not too long ago that if, that if you broke your word, that, that you would not be trusted by anyone, that you would have difficulty interacting in the marketplace, in social circles, because people would know, well, that, that, that man, that woman, they're not trustworthy. They'll say one thing and do another. But today, sadly, we've moved into a place where that's kind of almost the way life seems to want to work because everyone wants to have their own truth and break it and keep it whenever it feels right or wrong. When's the last time you, were, you heard someone actually be critical about politicians we hear offhandedly on the news where people are making critiques and they'll say things like, well, you know, they said that, but that was during, uh, you know, that was during uh, their, their campaign. And we know, I mean, politicians are going to say what they got to say during their campaign. And it's just like accepted that people aren't expected to be yes is yes, no is no, trustworthy and have integrity in their speech. And not even, not even to say amongst just our neighbors and ourselves, how often is it that, that you might catch a situation or be tempted to think, well, I'll just tell this little lie because I need to defuse this situation, or I just, I'll, 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 I'll not pick up on this truth, or I'll do this or do that because it's going to get really crazy if I don't. It'd be a lot easier if we just tell this little white lie. And it's become almost culturally acceptable for these things. In a culture that's rejected the importance of, of truth and as we're stepping into another massive jump forward in technology that I think many of us are not ready for and have no idea what's really coming and what's already begun, it is critical that we be trustworthy of our speech and have integrity and character in these areas. And as we look at these few verses, what I want us to see is that, that Christians are to have integrity in their speech to the glory of God. And we're going to look at three things, a, a call to truthfulness in speech, Honoring God in speech and Christ's life, integrity in speech. So the first thing we're going to look at together, this call to truthfulness in, in speech. Christ, right off the bat in this section of his sermon, he's rejecting the religious leaders' false teaching on oaths and vows. Now these, these oaths and vows are just another place where the rabbis had come in and they'd done the extremes that we see uh, in the world and even in the church and amongst people who claim the name of Christ. And, and they have sought in different ways to try to earn their self-righteousness. They, they want to convince themselves they can keep God's law. So you know, they begin with how the importance of God's law is. They want to keep it. And then they begin to water it down. And then they begin to add their traditions on top of that. And there's this strange combination of a disregarding of a God's law and an adding to and an increasing of God's law that they do, trying to, to muddy the water or to dilute the water, as it were. And Jesus even comes in here and he begins it and he quotes the, the tradition that's going around. It wasn't even... It wasn't even a specific command that had been grabbed here, but it was a tradition that was a, a, a mishmash of different Old Testament Bible verses regarding oaths and vows and keeping these things that they had, they had pulled together. A few of these, to give you an idea, if you want to look them up later on your own, Exodus 20, verse 7, Leviticus 19, verse 12, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Those are a couple of the examples of what they had taken meshed together to create this tradition of theirs that Christ is coming and, 
in, in dealing with. And we know there's an issue here because we go forward a little bit here in the, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 23. We begin reading in verse 16. Now, this is Jesus. He's interacting with the scribes and the Pharisees. And in 20, chapter 23, verse 16, uh, we come to Jesus, and he's saying this to them. Woe to you, blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears his oath, you blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has been made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the, the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and, and by him who sits upon it. Then he goes on again calling them hypocrites and bringing these, these warnings to them. And Jesus is telling his disciples, do not follow this false teaching and tradition of the religious leaders. Don't do it. It's causing you to be untruthful in your speech, to act as if these oaths and these things, some of them, you really need to keep this type of oath. But, you know, you throw an oath out on this, I don't have to really worry about it. You don't have to be truthful in your speech. But it's not okay to... It's not okay to act like some places require integrity. And then there's others that we can basically just lie. And Jesus is condemning that. Truth matters. And we see that there's a, a calling to submit to all of our swearing of oaths and vows to the authority of God's word. Again, Christ is, is focusing on this. Don't, don't pursue these, these muddled traditions of the religious leaders. They're leading you astray. And think about what they're doing back to 23 where he really was hitting on them. They are toying. They are toying with God. They're playing with God like, like many of the surrounding pagan nations might play with their false demonic gods. When you invoke something, when you swear, when you make an oath by God's name or the things of God, that's serious. Now, sadly, many of us think it's not a big deal. Like when we have membership and we're going to take vows, I, I, I try to really make it clear to the people that you're about to take. Listen, you're not just about to say some words. You're not just making a promise to the elders. You are making this promise to God. God, the one who is giving you breath right now, who's holding this universe together, who created everything out of nothing by speaking it into existence, who has created far-flung things in this universe for his own pleasure and glory that we can't even see with the most advanced technology that we've developed. That's the God you want to toy with and play with and throw his name around and act like he's not a big deal? Truthfulness and speech is very important. God tells us in Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. An abomination's a bad thing. I can remember before the Lord saved me, telling little white lies just wasn't a big deal. If it made the conversation go easier, if it was whatever needed to happen to make things better, just I didn't care, my friends didn't care. There was almost like this game going on, like, whoa, what, what is actually true that my friends are all saying? Which is crazy. Children always tell the truth. Adults, tell the truth. Be trustworthy in your speech. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And we want to also notice here, as we talk about this submitting to God's word, that Jesus isn't saying don't swear oaths. Some have run down that, that uh, road where they would say, well, I can't take vows of membership, or 
you know, an elder can't take vows or a deacon can't take vows or I can't take a vow. I can't go into a courtroom and take an oath before I give my testimony. I think that's not a, an accurate, robust understanding here. We can even read in the Gospels and we'll see there towards the end as, as Christ is brought before the Sanhedrin and there's interactions there. There is, uh, I think, clearly the context that Christ is even accepting He's taking an oath before the religious leaders who are asking him those questions in that trial setting. So Jesus is not fully responding to those things. He's saying that you need to disregard this tradition, this untrustworthy aspect of vows, and you need to submit to the authority of God's word. I think we see here that Jesus is also saying that everyone, and especially Christians, especially disciples of Christ, especially God's people, need to always speak truth. Always speak the truth. Believe the truth that God gives us. Believe his word. Live God's truth. Reject the silliness of my truth. No, I don't care what your truth is. I want to know what God's truth is. That's what we want to submit to. God's truth. Be truthful. Never lie. Have integrity in all things. You know, and sometimes to be truthful, we need to say no to good things, that we might be able to maintain our word and truthfulness and speech. Some of that comes to guarding schedules to be truthful. I know one of the challenges that I have is, is all these things are going on and, and church planting and, and presbytery requests and interactions with others and being a husband and a, and a father and in all the different areas, there are so many good things that are laid out that, that it's, that's there's got to be some no's. Or I'm going to start being untrustworthy in my speech because I'm going to say, I can get that done, and, and I can't. And that's an area I pray you would help me, and I pray the same for y'all because I'm not the only person that has a lot going on. All of us have a lot going on. There is a lot to do. So let us be truthful and trustworthy in these things. Jesus never lied. Jesus never made a false false vow, vow and oath. And thankfully, in Christ, as we're redeemed and forgiven, we have his perfect oath, vow, and law-keeping applied to us. So in Christ, we're perfectly truthful, which is beautiful. But then the other wonderful thing about being saved and then sanctification, the Spirit working in us and growing in grace, is that because of Christ, we have the ability to grow in truthfulness. So that ye, as the days and months and years go on, through the means of grace working in us, that we're able to look and say, man, God, praise you. I look back, I am so, so much more truthful than I used to be. That's you working. That's you giving me the strength, me dedicating myself to the means of grace and warring for these things. This call to truthfulness and speech. And then there's the second point we see here, honoring God in speech. Importance of honoring God. And we need to respect God's sovereignty over all of his creation, and over all his creatures, going back to the the reality and the idea that we were talking about. You know, we don't want to play around with who God is and and the importance of uh, we don't want to just kind of throw his name around like, oh, well, you know, if I throw God's name on this, then everyone knows this is serious. We want to honor God in our speech. You know, Psalm 24 makes it clear, specifically, but all the scriptures give us this in the context, that the universe and everything in it is God's. He created it, he sustains it, he rules it. And that's a good thing. And it reminds us who God is. We might keep that in mind. Knowing God, the creator, the ruler, sustainer, Knowing who he is, I hope, out of our love for him, drives us to want to speak in such a way that, that our words would glorify him so that we would be truthful in our speech and we would honor him in our speech. And all the words that we say, how we use his name, his titles, but also how we go about making promises and keeping those promises and holding to his truth. And that we might avoid... And we're seeking to honor God, we would avoid 
taking God's name in vain. Here's a look at the third commandment. Exodus 20, verse 7 is a good place to go. It says not to take God's name in vain. And right off the bat, we think, oh, yeah, well, then I, I shouldn't curse. Use God's name in, in, in cursing. Or, yes, that's true, but that's just a, a little bit of not taking God's name in vain. There's much, much, much more to that. It has a lot to do with our attitude towards God and, and how we treat him and how we talk about him and, and the things he's given to us. As one PCA pastor has written about this, if you want a, a simple summary of the third commandment, a New Testament exhortation, putting in positive language all that is required of us, here it is. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We obey the third commandment by living as Christians, by speaking and doing everything according to the family name. For when we do all that we do and do it in Christ and through Christ, we show that his is the name we value, the name we love, and the name that is above all names. If we find ourselves in a place where our word is so shallow that we have to constantly be like, I, I swear to God, I swear to God, this, just listen to me, or anything else past that, I swear on the Bible, or something of that nature. If we have to try to bring God into the argument behind what we're saying, it's a clear indication that our word is empty and holds no weight. And then in our efforts to try to put weight behind it, we use God's name in vain. Because our glorious God's name is not there for us to use as a prop in our conversations or in a way to try to make people think we're serious about what it is we're talking about. And I pray that none of us find ourselves thinking so little of God that we would just flippantly throw his name around carelessly in the things from his word. Children, youth, adults, let us remember that Christ, Jesus died on the cross so that, so that we might be forgiven and that forgiveness that we might grow in love and, and trust and honor of the Lord and, and having that, it, I hope would prick our con conscience anytime we're tempted to, to begin to take God's name in vain and not honor him in our speech and to not be truthful in our speech. And that brings us to our, our final thing we're going to look at is integrity. Consistency in, in word and deed. We see a call here from, from Christ, I believe. Return to uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, John writes this. He says, little children, so he's writing to believers, to Christians, to disciples of Christ. He says, little children, affectionately he writes this, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So let's, let's just like talk about how much we love. But let's put our love, this, this love of Christ that we have, let's put it not only into action, but also behind the fact that we believe and live by the truth of God's word. It's, an, it's important. Christ wants us to be consistent in our Christian character. And I think we can all agree that, that lying and being untrustworthy in our speech is, is antithetical. It's the opposite of being godly. It's the opposite of Christian character. Now, we're going to lie. We're going to be untrustworthy in our speech. We're going to not honor God at times. We're going we're gonna to have times where we don't have integrity in speech because we're, we're sinful. But when we do, by God's grace, we go. We ask God's forgiveness. We seek to, to mend what we say to others and correct these things. And Christians, by God's grace, need to be people who are known for integrity, particularly as we head into the what it seems to be where we're headed as a culture and as we continue down this road. 
humbly I put before you, I think that just being a people that have integrity is going to make Christians stand out like a glow stick in a dark room. Because we live in a world where, particularly in our own culture, where integrity is not something that we see or is valued or is important. And that alone will be a witness to Christ who will cause people to stop and say, I mean, when, that, when those people say they're going to do something, they do it. When those people say they're not going to do something, they don't do it. Like, I, I can actually figure out where they stand on things. I'm not constantly wondering where they're going to fall out. And I pray, particularly here at Christ Church, that we would be a people of integrity. We turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. I think Paul, speaking to the Ephesian church here, is specifically, I think, pointing at the end there to, to life in the body of Christ. We would put away falsehood. We'd speak truth to one another. We, by God's grace, would continue to do these things. We turn to James, this little letter towards the end of the Scriptures, James chapter 5, verse 12. And, and James reiterates what Jesus says, what we just read in our section, in our passage. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. James repeating what Christ teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount. It's integrity. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Reject the tradition that's being taught by the religious leaders that you've got you to play all these games and there's, there's these levels of, of what actually has to be maintained and you make this promise, well, because you did it this way, it's, it doesn't really, maybe if you keep 30% of it, it's going to be okay and God understands, but you make your promise this way with this formula, oh man, you better do it all. Jesus is saying, that's, that's hogwash. Have integrity. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. And let's, let's encourage each other in that. Let's pray for that. That we might be godly in all of our actions and the way we speak. That we would always be honest and trustworthy. Proverbs Chapter 10, verse 19, tells Christians to guard against careless speech. We do. And it can be a temptation, I understand, but we need to slow down and think, what is it I'm about to say? What am I about to say to someone? What am I about to post online? What am I about to put out before the world? What am I about to put out to my family? What am I about to put out to my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Let's think about what we're about to say and why. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3 tells Christians the importance of building integrity because deceitfulness destroys you. It's like a cancer that rots in your bones. Adults listen, but children too. All of us listen. It's better to be honest. And then by God's grace we deal with what falls. Then to be deceitful and attempt to live these webs of lies. We started with a, a short little sentence from Sinclair Ferguson. We're going to end with another. As he writes, Truth is sacred and our speech should honor it. Have we lost this value today in the Christian life as much as we fear it has been lost in public life? Is our yes really yes? Does it carry definite commitment or are we given to modifying the truth and disguising it is our word reliable do we do what we say we'll do can people trust us as models of integrity well christians are to have integrity in their speech to the glory of god let's pray Lord, we ask that you would help us to do just this. We rejoice that you are working in us and, and that Christ has made this possible. We rejoice that, that Christ is trustworthy and he has all integrity. 
he honors you and everything he says, Father. And we ask that the Spirit would grow us in that Christ-likeness and help us as we mature in godly sanctification that we too would have integrity in our speech and that everything we say and do would glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let us respond to the reading and preaching of God's Word as, as we sing together. So I invite you to stand as we sing Only a Holy God on pages 10 and 11 in your order of service. blessing and benediction of our great God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.